Has anyone ever heard of the phrase, the heart wants what it wants? Yeah. Anybody? Let me see your hands. I'm a, I'm a visual learner. Okay. So just about everybody. That's helpful. So I, I know that Selena Gomez came out with a song some odd years ago, the heart wants what it wants. I'm not going to sing that for you because I don't want to be publicly embarrassed and I don't want to ruin your day after beautiful worship like that. Um, but... A lot of people are familiar with that phrase, they're familiar with that song, but I feel like I want to ask the room again, just real quick, does anyone know where that phrase originated from? Anybody? Besides Dante, who got to look at my notes early this morning. <laughs> so he's being generously kind, not telling us all. But the, the, the phrase actually came from the 1990s in that, in that time, and there was this famous American filmmaker named Woody Allen. Maybe you're familiar with some of his works. He's come out with one of my personal favorites of him is Midnight in Paris. It stars Owen Wilson. Really, really good movie. Very creative. And um, he was actually married in the 90s to a model named Mia Farrow. And Mia Farrow had this huge heart. And so something that she did was she adopted several children into their marriage. Um, and, and, and just, you know, beautiful how great that is. Uh, just different nationalities, different ethnicities. And um, the story takes kind of a really weird turn. So I'm just going to go ahead and fair warn you that the phrase comes from a really devastating origin. That about 15 years later, um, Woody Allen had this infamous affair with one of the adopted children that they had adopted named Soon Yi Previn. Yeah, it's I'm sorry. I know we were so cheerful and, and, and excited about adoption and how amazing that is. But it just takes a really, really, really weird turn when um, at some point in the early you know, 2000s or so, this relationship had formed. They had begun sleeping together and, and they then began to publicly date each other. And then eventually this would lead to them um, getting more serious and eventually marrying each other. So it's really weird and really awkward. And then in 2001, the Times Magazine was interviewing Woody Allen, and you can kind of see the interviewer just professionally doing his job really well, and he's sort of prodding and poking at him, and he's going like, don't you think it was at least a little wrong what you did? And Allen, over and over, you can actually look up the 2001 interview, and time and time again, he disputes it, he comes up with different excuses. He says, well, I was never a father figure to her. I barely knew her. This happened innocently. And it's, it's just cringe, to be honest with you guys. I was reading back through the interview, and I was like, this is just gross and weird and awkward. And then at some point, Woody Allen finally famously looks back at the interviewer and says, you know what? The heart wants what it wants. The heart wants what what it wants. I probably just destroyed Selena Gomez's music career because I don't think, well, at least this is a small portion of people, but I feel like you're never going to want to listen to that song again. But that has become this really well-known phrase that we all commonly know. It doesn't matter what gender you are. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. Most of us are familiar with the phrase, the heart wants what it wants. But that, unfortunately, is its origin story. Why do I share that? Because, and I'll be honest with you, when we were going through this sermon series and looking at all the different parts of Thessalonians, when I read it months before, I thought to myself, I'd love just to skip past this chapter, at least the eight verses of chapter four. Um, but the truth is, I'm just so thankful for the word of God. I'm thankful that scripture is grounded. I'm thankful that it's truth. It, it helps us in moments like this when we talk about lust we talk about the reality of sexual immorality and what that means and, and even our flesh that can be on high demand desiring for us to just like Alan take what our heart wants. But scripture speaks a better word. Amen? And um, even the idea of lust. See, lust, more times than not, yes, is, is sexual. And I would say just because I'm, I want to be very careful here as a pastor, I would just say that parents, you, this is a very like fair warning. So if there's any little ones, this would maybe be a good message to ask them to go elsewhere. So I'm just putting that out there for fair warning before we go any further. 
Um, just want to do that for you guys. But the idea of lust, the actual word of lust, um, not attached just to the promiscuity of it, is it strongly desiring or craving something that you do not yet have or that you cannot have. That's where we actually get the origin of lust. It's this craving of, I want this, but I cannot yet have it. And in fact, I would say that that was the sin of what Adam and Eve fell to in the garden when, when, when sin was first originated. God would say, all these things you can have except this one thing. And there was this one thing that they craved and longed for and desired and took for themselves. Also, just a quick house note. Jordan, if you wouldn't mind for me, can you turn these fans off? Because I'm feeling the heat that's coming down. And I love these people enough to say that. Thank you. We're still learning the building a little bit. Um, so all that to be said, this is what we're working with. There's four things that we're going to touch on throughout this sermon. First, God's freedom is found in God's commands. Secondly, the reality of our hyper-sexualized world. Number three, what we need to do about it as Christians. What is our call to action? And number four, why sexual intimacy is no match for God's intimacy. We, when we first began this series, we sort of had this playful graphic. Brandon did an amazing job of bringing this thing to life. And we talked about the spiritual report card that Paul had given the Thessalonians. And Jordan's going to put that on the screen. And maybe you noticed this. Maybe you notice all the A's, but then in purity, there was that C minus. And this was a wink to this chapter right here, um, because as we open up the text in chapter four, Paul has just done such a good job, job pastoring these people and loving them. He has um, encouraged them. He's, he's been pr uh, ha had pride for them. He's been so proud of them and how they've overcome so much adversity. He's implored even his own example to them. But we get into this fourth chapter, and this is where I think Paul really starts to pastor these people. It's almost as if he's like, I feel, I want you to know that I love you, and I'm encouraged by your progress, but I want to call you deeper and higher. And so we pick up in chapter 4, verse 1, and it says this, Finally then, brothers and sisters, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more. Just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. So we're just going to stop there for a second. And I'm already going to give you sort of my first point to this message. I already called it out. But it's this. God's freedom is found in God's commands. God's freedom is found in God's commands. You don't have to look far to discover the truth of that point. Verse 1, Paul says, I want you to abound more and more. That's fancy, you know, ancient talk for Paul essentially saying, I want you to abound in the greatest freedom possible for you. But it's not going to be found in your flesh. It's not going to be found in your lust. It's not going to be found in your desires of these fleshly ways. He actually goes on in verse 2 and he says that freedom if you want to abound more and more, that freedom is going to be found in the commandments that we gave you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But what specifically is Paul alluding to? I really enjoy how Bible teacher Grant C. Richardson, he says this, that the design of the Christian life is to teach us God's viewpoint on life by forming that viewpoint into principles. When we apply those principles by faith, God transforms our lives. When we apply those viewpoints in the place of faith, transformation is reaped within us. Principles are lifeless without application. What is Richardson getting to? See, I think in, in, in Christian circles, here's the mistake we make. And I will tell you that this is so true of the outside world that would look in at Christianity and, and think that we're just mind-washed that we believe in a fairy God, that we believe a Bible that was written 2,000 years ago that is just manipulation to take our money and give power to those leaders. And all that to be said, we as Christians believe that God is actually a good Father. He's actually a good Creator. And so my point is that we want freedom, right? We want freedom. Everybody in the world would say, man, I would love to have freedom. 
But the lie the devil has so easily sold in the American dream is if you want freedom, then just do what the heart wants. Do what the heart wants. If this is what you feel, if this is what you desire, if this is what you crave and long for, then just do it. Be you. Be the true you. Yet the Gospels would so many times say it's no longer I who live. Jesus would say, you want to follow me? Pick up your cross daily and follow me. And so there's this anti-gospel message being promoted in the world today, and it even finds footing in the place of God's commands. See, for so many of us, if we're not careful, we make the mistake of viewing God's commands as God's control. God giving us a list of things just so he can control us like a puppet. But in reality, our creator desires us to live, and I believe this, the best and healthiest versions of ourselves, and therefore He's given us commands to do just that. Think about it. God who knit us together in our mother's womb. God who I believe had breathed His rhema, His spirit, into our souls so that we would have life and have it abundantly. And so God, as a good creator, would say, I need to give these guys instruction so they know how to live rightly. I, not in my notes, but I think back in, in the Old Testament times, and um, I believe it's Josiah. And just give me some grace if I'm wrong here, because this is not in my notes. But I believe it's Josiah, and he rediscovers the Torah, the Old Testament scriptures, the scrolls. And the people have this massive gathering, and he opens the scroll, and he begins to read it to them. And the word says that all of them begin to weep and remorse for their wrongdoing, for their flesh, for their sin. But then there's this amazing moment where he gets before them and goes, brothers and sisters, don't weep, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. In other words, he is saying in this moment that this is a rejoicing moment because we were once lost, but we've been found. God has given back to us his words. But imagine us as Christians that we're so quick to just let our Bibles sit in dust. But for these people, they were weeping and then their leader would say, no, 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 rejoice. The joy of the Lord is going to be your strength. We can actually celebrate repentance because at least we know we're in the wrong. It's like, how amazing is it that God and His love wouldn't just create us and then leave us? That's heresy to believe that. But he, not only is he in heaven, but he intercedes for us on our behalf. And he gave his only son, who orchestrated the church as we know it today, who wrote holy and sacred letters that we use today to know what God desires of us. And here's the cool thing, is when we actually do what God has invited us to do, we become the best versions of ourselves. This is why Jesus, in John 14, would say, if you love me, Keep my commands. If you love me, keep my commands. Jesus' love is unconditional, but his freedom is contingent on us continuing in his commands. His love is unconditional, but his freedom, the freedom that he wants to give us, is completely contingent on if we will continue in the commands that he's given us. God's commands is where we find God's freedom. And what is that command that Paul gave the Thessalonians? It was this, in verse 3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. That you should abstain from this. This destructful way of life. Now, I want to just invite you into the context of what Paul is talking about. And I'm going to read a couple paragraphs here. But be Bible teachers with me right now. Be historians. I want you to fully understand why Paul is writing to these people saying you must abstain from this sexual promiscuity. See, Greek cities like Thessalonica, they were wide open for all kinds of sexual looseness, including immorality associated with their pagan idol worship. Pagan religions did not demand sexual purity of their followers. In fact, these man-made false gods were created to encourage immorality in order to fulfill the lewd desires of the flesh. Temporary pleasures were traded in for people's consciousness that they became dull, darkened, and hardened. Romans 1 alludes to this. 
that they gave up the gift of God for these fleshly desires. Pagan temples would actually be accompanied by something called priestesses or religious prostitutes. Just think about that for a second. And they would be in these temples so that they could help aid men to worship the immoral idols. Roman culture, which is what Paul is living in uh, and the abundance that surrounds all of the Thessalonians, had very few sexual boundaries and the Greek religion considered prostitution a priestly prerogative. In other words, prostitution was like a role in the church to these people. It was this high and incredible priestly anointed position. Imagine that. The sanctity of marriage was so distorted that extramarital sex was actually considered to be an act of worship. Now, I want to help you understand what I'm talking about because I just want to be so black and white about this. Extramarital, that's like taking advantage of your spouse and treating them like an object and getting what you want from them and that being enough. And these people were sold a lie that that was how you worship the false gods. This immorality, it was so common among the heathen that even Christians were apt to look on it with a measure of indifference or even complacency. What I'm telling you is that the Christians were so crushed by this pressure of a hyper-sexualized culture that was not just idolizing sex as worship, but believed that it was worship. And Christians were being crushed by the pressures of this, that they would fall into the pressure to believe, well, maybe it's okay. Maybe it's okay to be complacent in this department. Maybe there's something true about this. And I will be the first to tell you that sex is a gift from God. Sex is a beautiful gift that God's given us, but I think this is a very helpful image. It's like a fireplace, okay? I love building fires. We have a fireplace in our house, but Amanda might kill me if I start a fire in the kitchen. Well, that's more likely. Maybe in our bedroom, maybe in the guest room, right? Like, you don't start a fire anywhere else but a fireplace. Can, can I get some testifying there? That makes sense, right? But in the same way, if we're not careful, we take advantage of the idea of sex, and we see it just as a feeling or a pleasure or a desire and not an act of actually lovingly laying our life down for the one that we love and vice versa. It's a gift, but these people were taking advantage of this gift and this is why it was wrong. So in this context, Paul knew that he could not assume that the conversion of the Thessalonians would automatically undo moral habits of a lifetime. And we've all learned that, haven't we? When we said yes to Jesus... Did that yes to salvation take away all these horrible habits that you once had in your life? Not usually. I believe that he can supernaturally, miraculously deliver someone in a moment, but I also believe that he loves you enough that he wants to journey with you the rest of your life to sanctify you. He was aware, Paul, of the strong temptations to licentiousness constantly assailing the Thessalonians. It was likely that Timothy, when he came back to the report to Paul, said, Paul, the church is still there and they're doing well. They're worshiping, they're gathering, they're fighting off these things, but there's a few things they're struggling with. And clearly this was one of them. Paul had a concern that even though they brought the gospel in its fullness to these people, they were still struggling with only God knows of the strongholds of sexual immorality in their day. So this is who Paul's writing to, and this is why he's writing to them. But as Christians in the 21st century, we must ask the question, what about us? What about our culture that we live in today? We live in a hyper-sexualized culture, and there is a pornographic epidemic at the core of that. And so I want to show you guys a video in just a moment that I think speaks to the core issue of our hyper-sexualized culture. Pornhub is the largest and most popular porn site in the world. Owned by the mega porn parent company MindGeek, Pornhub averages 42 billion visits per year. That's 115 million visits every day. Most of the content featured on their site is user generated, amassing 6 million new videos each year. That would take 169 years to watch. Pornhub has become the global epicenter of internet pornography. The company makes hundreds of millions of dollars through ad revenue data collection and premium subscriptions and it's blatantly enabling and profiting from rape sexual abuse and child sex trafficking 
like the missing 15-year-old girl who was found after 58 videos of her rape were posted on Pornhub. Or Rose Kalemba, the 14-year-old, who the BBC reported was kidnapped at knife point, raped and assaulted on camera for 12 hours, and had to beg Pornhub for months and threaten legal action to remove the videos of her rape and torture. Or the images of a toddler being sexually abused, found through an investigation by the Sunday Times. Or the 22 women who were deceived and coerced by the producers of Girls Do Porn, a popular Pornhub partner channel, whose owners now face a federal indictment for child pornography, sex trafficking of a minor, sex trafficking, and sexual abuse. These examples only begin to scratch the surface of the sexual crimes found on Pornhub. According to the Internet Watch Foundation, in only two years, they processed and confirmed 118 cases of child rape and trafficking on Pornhub. These aren't models or actresses playing a role in a movie. These are real videos of women and children being sexually abused, violated, and traumatized. And Pornhub is deeply complicit. They have no system to reliably verify the age or consent of anyone featured in the videos it profits from. The largest porn site in the world makes it insanely easy for users to upload videos of real sexual violence. And in doing so, they forever memorialize the trauma of their victims, all for the profit and pleasure of Pornhub and its users. It's time to shut down Pornhub and hold them accountable for the rape, trafficking and sexual abuse that they enable and profit from. Share this video and sign the petition at traffickinghub.com. Uh, so obviously, <clears throat> I know that that's not easy to watch, um, but I think it's really, really important that if we're going to talk about sexual promiscuity and immorality in our day and age, we have to get very honest with the facts. I don't just want to tell you that this is wrong. I don't just want to point to why scripturally this is wrong. I think the video speaks for itself. That so many people are being taken advantage of and it's coming from the core issue of lust. It's this deceitful, devilish, twisted, perverted desire to go, I want this feeling and I'm going to take it at whatever cost. And I just feel like we need to rip the bandaid off this thing. And especially as Christians, just like Jordan had referenced in Psalm 103, that God's a God of mercy, but he's a God of justice. And I just pray that even as I teach on this in my own heart, that the Lord would begin to uncover these things, that we would not be desensitized to the reality of this sin and brokenness that is pornography. There's a couple of statistics I want to share with you from Barna Research. The first is that almost 50% of people come across porn at least once a week, which that might not sound staggering, but even when they aren't seeking it out. See, that's the part that concerns me, that over half the population in America, pornography finds its way to them even if they're not seeking it out personally. Less than 1% of young adults, think about that, less than 1% of young adults, and only 1% of teens say that their friends think viewing pornography is a bad thing. In fact, they voted that not recycling was more immoral than viewing porn. Just think about that for a moment. While porn has typically been a man's domain, its usage among young women seemed to have become more common, perhaps due to the digital age. Male practicing Christians who use porn from the ages of 13 to 24 are 41%. That grieves me because that's the future of our churches. It's the future of our generations to come. It's just under 50%. And 25 or older is at 23%. Female practicing Christians who use porn are ages 13 to 24 are 13%. And a 25 or older at 5%. Over half, at 54% of porn users, say it doesn't bother them that they use pornography. One in five people and one in three Christians and 40% of Christians who come under this poll of saying that they consistently use pornography wish they didn't rely on porn at all. And while that's incredible, only 40% of Christians that are addicted to this, only 40% wish they weren't. 
This hypersexualized culture we live in makes the Christian vision of sexuality and relationships seem naive, unreasonable, and impossible. And there are effects to this in our culture today. Those effects are that pornography is routine and morally fine. That masturbation is reasonable and only natural. That virginity is insignificant and irrelevant. And that marriage is non-committal and self-indulgent. See, the real problem with all of this is that it, it, it's an attack against the image of God that we were created in. God's image becomes irrelevant to man's purpose. I'm going to say that again. God's image becomes irrelevant to man's purpose. Here's the problem. The purpose of man was to be created in the image of God. The Imago Dei, the reason we exist as God's creation, comes under attack when we see the gift of sexuality that God has given us and we pervert it for selfish gain. And so I hope at this point that you have a pit in your stomach. I hope that you are not condemned, but you are convicted. I hope that you feel sick to yourself and that we remember the truth and the reality of these statistics because, beloved, the church, this cannot be our story. This cannot be our story. And I believe in the power of repentance and I believe in the power of transformation and I believe in the power of intercession. And I believe if we can be free of this, then we take a place of authority for the church to say this must end. And we're going to talk more about that. So the second half of the sermon, what do we as believers, what do we do about this? My first point to that is that we must stop fighting sporadically and start fleeing strategically. Stop fighting sporadically and start fleeing strategically. I'm going to break that down because for some of us, and I know men especially, the idea of fleeing feels foolish. But the Bible actually breaks this down and talks about this. See, for us, when I mean fight sporadically, if, if, if men and women, I'm sure, but I can speak from a personal experience that I would begin to try and fight this when I would feel the urge, but my fight would only give myself further into the urge. It was almost like I was hyper-focused on it all of a sudden. When you're so paranoid about something, it has your attention and it has your focus and it eventually takes you with it. I even think about this in historic battles. Fredericksburg is such a place of historic battles and history here. But whenever any army had the advantage of the other one, the first strategic thing would not be to fight against those that have the advantage against you, it would be to flee. Because if you can flee and recover what men you still have and reposition yourselves, you still have a chance in the war. But if your enemy got the advantage over you in that moment and you tried to fight against them, the statistics are outrageous that you lost the battle and eventually the war. And so I believe there's wisdom for us as believers when it comes to the sin of sexual morality that we need to start fleeing more strategically. There are some places where we need to fight and we must stand up, but the Bible makes it clear that this is not one of those. In fact, Paul would say in verse 3 that this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. We just talked about that. But that word abstain says to put distance between. Hail, another definition is to hold oneself or keep oneself away from the contact of influence of sexual morality. That's pretty black and white. There's not a lot of gray there. Paul would go on in 1 Corinthians, and quite frankly, Corinth was much worse than Thessalonica when it came to sexual promiscuity and immorality. Paul was writing to the church of Thessalonica in Corinth. So Paul is in the cross heirs of sexual morality, and he says in 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that man does is outside of the body, but he who commits sexual morality sins against his own body. We're going to come back to that verse in a moment. But here's another verse I want to give you. And this is St. Peter. And Peter writing in 1 Peter. And he's not just writing to a particular church. He's writing to several churches. And he's very old at this point. Think about the history, the journey of Peter. He's so wise at this point. And he says, and you're probably familiar with this, love covers a multitude of sins. And I feel like we've heard that scripture a lot. But what does it mean? Well, the word cover translates to this. To hinder the knowledge of a thing. To hinder the knowledge of it. 
I jokingly think about this, that when Amanda and I would, whenever we drive past Route 3 and we're passing cookout, I know that there's a 67% chance that she's going to say, let's get a milkshake. And then there's a 100% chance that we're going to go back and forth. I just want to go home. Please, just one milkshake. And we kind of go back and forth, back and forth. And I've learned that love covers a multitude of sins. If I don't pass cookout, we don't go to cookout. Does that make sense? So this is what Peter's talking about. Don't give sin a chance. God would say to Cain, sin is crouching at the door. Don't give it a chance. Jesus would say to Peter, Satan wants to sift you. Don't give him a chance. Don't give him a foothold. I remember, and just want to be, I just want to rip this thing open and be so honest about this. I remember uh, months ago, I was in my cadre, and I had just started a TikTok account for the church of all things. And I had been off TikTok for years. I didn't really care to be back on it. And I couldn't believe just how bad it was on there. You don't need Pornhub. Just go to TikTok. It's just unbelievable. And I just would see these women just throwing their bodies on the screen. And it started to put hooks in me. And I started to go, I, don't, I'm not, I know I'm not supposed to look at that. I'm not going to look at that. But then I would just glance at it. And if I glanced at it, then I would stay a little too long on it. Now, thankfully, God is good. And it's really good to have accountability. And I ended up confessing that to these guys. And I was like, guys... I have got to confess this thing because this is going to get me down quick. And I don't want to get addicted to this thing. And I don't want to fall to this thing because this will take me down. This won't just affect ministry. More importantly, this will affect marriage. And Dante was able to give me a tip that if you hold on these videos and you can just reject it and completely get it off your stream. Because I needed to not see this crap because if I saw it, I would fall to it. So love covers a multitude of sins. And I'm telling you guys, And we're going to talk more about this. But whatever it takes, cut your hand off, pluck your eye out. Flee from sexual morality. The great Charles Spurgeon says this, Do not dabble with pornea, Greek for sexual immorality. Do not dabble with it. This is one of the greatest theologians of the history of mankind. Right, Billy? And this is what he would say. Don't dabble with it. Don't trifle with it. Argue about it. Don't debate it. Don't explain it. And certainly do not rationalize it as a spiritual challenge to be met, but as a spiritual trap to be escaped. Cut the dripping faucet off at the first drop. Get away as fast as you can. God gives such a clear and strong command because pornea is so serious, corrupting, and shattering of spiritual relationships, both human and and divine, so flee from it. Verse 4, Paul says, Each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Here's what Paul's doing. See, if I preach this message to a worldly people, they would laugh at me. They would think that I'm out of my mind. But I'm preaching to the beloved of God right now. And Paul was preaching and writing to the beloved of God. He was writing to these Thessalonians who were consumed by sexual immorality all around them. And he would say, do not give in to this lust of passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. I love that Paul's not just writing to Jewish people. He's writing to Jews and Gentiles. And he's saying, don't be like those. Don't be like your past selves, essentially. You have a freedom in Jesus if you follow Jesus' ways. And so here's my second point. Stop excusing your flesh and start sanctifying your spirit. Stop excusing your flesh. Start sanctifying your spirit. See that word passion in that verse, passion of lust. It's this, excited emotion, uncontrollable desire, compelling feelings, overpowering urges. Isn't this the ingredients and the recipe we go to say, well, it's just one time. Well, I'll just get it out of my system really quick. Well, I'll just look and I won't touch. Beloved, I'm telling you that this is the seed to destruction. That this is just one small pebble, but as it rolls down that snowy hill, it becomes a massive snowball that cannot be stopped. Do not give in to the flesh. I don't care if you feel called to it, if you feel the excited emotion of it uncontrollable desire for it, compelling feelings. There is no excuse. If especially if we have the Spirit of God living in us. 
That the Lord would say, don't you get it? I put myself in you. What we read about in Exodus, that Moses would say, I just want one glimpse. And God would say, Moses, I don't want to blow your face off, bro. I love you enough. But I'll put you deep in a cave and I'll walk by and you can just see my backside. And then his face was like he went to some sunning tan, whatever. Uh, what are those called? I, I don't know. Tanning bed. Thank you. I just ruined everything. It's a great point. It's a great point there. But that's what it is. And God in his love would find a way to manifest himself inside of us. Oh, I pray that we would just have a vision for that. What is sanctification? Paul uses this word, sanctification. Well, it consists of two things. One, ceasing to do evil. In other words, repentance. The first work of sanctification is overcoming the propensities of our sinful nature and checking and subduing the unholy habits which we have found before we became Christians. Before we became Christians. Sadly, I think this is where we start in our spiritual journey and where we get stuck in our spiritual journey. We think, oh, I'm new in the faith. I know not what to do, and I'm just on the defense all the time, and the Lord is going, don't you want to get baptized in the Holy Spirit? Don't you want to get filled with the presence of God? I know Tuesday night that that was happening. I could tell you firsthand, and I could hear it. Me and a couple of the guys are sitting on the porch, and we're like, you guys want to go to Taco Bell? Like, let's, <laughs> let's beat it, man. Like, they're going to be here for a while. That's the vision that God died for. That's what he's given, that we would taste and see that he's good. Amen? Amen. The second part to sanctification, and this is what I pray that we would walk in more and more and more, that Hannah is going to start walking and that Claire is going to start walking in because we're seeing it on display. Learning to do well, righteousness. Learning to do well, and that's really for all of us. I just say this because they've been such examples to us these last few weeks. The second part of Sanctification work consists in cultivating the positive principles of holiness in the soul. It's not just staying foundational. It's not just staying one-dimensional. It's growing. It's having a vision for your families. It's having a vision for your legacy. It's having something that you can pass on to your children. That they will grow up and go, I remember mom in the prayer closet. I remember dad's faith. No matter what conflict came, he was steady. He wasn't concerned. He just had a steadiness about him. Sanctification. And it's interesting to me that Paul would use that word know. I'm going to go back up here to verse 4. Each of you should know how to possess his own vessels in sanctification and honor. In other words, Paul is saying you should know better. See, there's two words in Greek that are know. First is gnosko, and that's experiential. I experienced something, so now I know it. I touched this stovetop, and so now I know not to do that again because that's a hot surface. But the word know here that Paul's using is oida, to know completely, obviously, and intuitively. He's saying, guys, you know good from evil. Listen to me. I don't care if you were saved or not saved. If you watch that video on Pornhub, you know that's evil. You know that's wrong. If you watch Sound of Freedom, I remember... Odell Beckham Jr. and Sound of Freedom is about child trafficking and the reality of it. And Odell Beckham Jr. is a famous star wide receiver in the NFL. And I saw him tweet, Sound of Freedom, amazing. And I thought, he's not saved. But God was speaking to him. He knows good from evil. Adam and Eve, guys, you know you did something wrong. You know good from evil. You became known to evil because you did disobedience in the sight of God. And so Paul's saying, you guys should know better. I want to call you higher. And church, we got to call each other higher. we got to call each other higher to say it's not enough like, to just get away with a little bit. It's not okay that only 40% of Christians that feel like they're addicted to pornography want to get delivered from it. And if there's anyone in this room that you're convicted and you resonate, this is a safe place. He's a good father. But he wants to take this away from you. So how? If sanctification is repenting from evil and walking in righteousness to do good, how do we act it out? Well, my third point, to control the body, you must rely on the Spirit. To control the body, you must rely on the Spirit. Paul made it crystal clear that in order to control the body, believers must rely on the Holy Spirit. 
See, I read to you guys just minutes ago, 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual morality. But I want to read to you the whole section now. Every sin that man does is outside of the body, but he who commits sexual morality sins against his own body. Verse 19, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In other words, Paul is saying, you want salvation? It's yours. Jesus died for you. But you get transformation after salvation. You become new in Christ. And this newness that we get to clothe ourselves in, to clothe ourselves in Christ, means that we surrender our lives as we know it. That we no longer respond to mere pleasure and desire. We actually give that up entirely and say the old is gone and the new has come. I'm a new creation. That word new means unblemished. It doesn't mean that you got in a a baptism pool and dirt washed off you and you came up and you were more clean. It means the old completely died. That you were born brand new. You were born in the Spirit again. And so there's something new living inside of you. You're not the same. That's why Saul would change his name to Paul. So I'm not the same guy I was. i got to change my name. It was a prophetic declaration of going, that guy completely died. And somebody was born new in this freedom. How do we do that as, as Christians? Well, first we walk by the Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. But how do we walk in the Spirit? How do we walk that out? Well, the key to walking in the Spirit is to be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.17 and 18 says, Do not get drunk with wine. Catch this. For that will only ruin your life. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Number three, the key to being Filled with the Spirit. How do we get filled with the Spirit? Is to marinate in the Spirit's presence and God's Word. Colossians 3.16, Let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you. The Bible says, eat the scroll. Eat it. Marinate in it. Be washed new in it. I love this quote from John Piper, pastor and really leader to the body of Christ. He says, the way to fight lust is to feed faith with the knowledge of an irresistibly glorious God. Do you know God this morning? Are you growing week by week in the knowledge of His greatness? Do you meditate on God's Word day and night? Do you ponder the pictures of His Son in the Gospels? Do you look at everything in your day as His creation? Do you pray for a sensitive heart that can be ravished by the revelation of His glory? I call you to make these commitments now for the sake of your own soul and for the glory of God. There's a higher vision that God wants to invite us into where we marinate in His presence and we're filled with His Spirit and then we walk in the Spirit. So here is my call to action to you in the room. To the single men and women, be people of integrity. Don't sow into the temptations of loneliness and the access to sensual pleasure through digital entertainment and acts of sexual immorality. In an age where hookup culture is a thing, persist and resist and believe that God has something better for you. To my friends that are in relationships, be weary of one-on-one time alone. Resist sleeping together and giving into sexual promiscuity. The Bible is so clear about this, guys. Regardless of love, well, I love him and I love her. Sin is sin. You know, the, the, the idea of why virginity is so important is because it's a prophetic act. That when we do these vows on our wedding day, there's a prophetic word being spoken. I am laying my life down for you that I am casting off all of who I was to become one flesh with you. It's these vows. It's these prophetic words that we're speaking. But a prophetic act follows with a prophetic action. And that prophetic action 
happens that night when two become one flesh symbolically and prophetically. Beloved, I'm telling you right now that God has a higher vision for sexuality than just sleeping with someone because you love them. Trust his word and you will get the reward of an amazing marriage because you put in the work in the dating season. To the married folk in the room, if you fall to pornography, confess this to one another and ask for forgiveness and pray. Pray together. We have to make allowance for each other's faults. That's what Ephesians 4 tells us. This is our scripture that we read over and over and over again in our relationship together. Make allowance for each other's faults because of love. If we are afraid to confess to one another, we're doomed. We have to learn how to even persist past the pain and the hardship. It's okay to go through seasons of hurt because it probably doesn't feel good when someone would confess that to you. But what does it look like to lovingly listen and work through it and forgive? Forgiveness. God wants to just do a work in the body of Christ in forgiveness. Forgiveness to say, I release you of your debts. And then to actually pray reconciliation and blessing over each other. If you are seeking affection or intimacy in any way from someone other than your spouse, confess this. And I want to say this just as a church. We will help you from a deep place of love and compassion. Deep place of love and compassion. But we can't give the devil a foothold in any way, shape, or form. In closing, worship team, if you guys want to play, Paul concludes in this section of First Thessalonians chapter 4 with verses 6 to 8. He says that none of you should take advantage and defraud his brother or sister in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such. And we also forewarned you and testified For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has given us the Holy Spirit. Guys, that last part where I said God's intimacy is greater than any form of sexual promiscuity or the world's idea of intimacy. I want you to hear me. Lust destroys love. It's my final point. Lust destroys destroys love it destroys communal intimacy it destroys marital intimacy but most of all it destroys godly intimacy see i remember being addicted to masturbation and i just wanted that feeling and whenever it came and i had the urge i just wanted to give into it and i remember after the act of falling into it i felt like an orphan suddenly i was so ashamed I was ashamed of what I had done, that I had given in to a fleeting feeling. But I remember when I would start to be around my my community and I just felt my heart hardened against people. And the Holy Spirit was faithful to finally go, bro, you're putting your heart in the wrong places. You're giving power to lust and it's stripping you of the place of intimacy communally. Thankfully, God has delivered me of that, but I can't tell you guys how many times I would just pray and repent and just had this holy dissatisfaction, this holy discontentment to go, Lord, this will not be my children's story. They will not have a dad that is stuck in this cycle. This will not be the problem of the woman I'm married to's problem one day. And God is good. Every act of repentance he hears The devil wants to convince you, give up. You've done it so many times, but I'm telling you again, come to the feet of Jesus and repent. I remember that when I would fall to this, I didn't even know who I was anymore and I didn't know who he was. Falling to lust, it has a unique way of making us feel like orphans. We lose the grip of our own identity as sons and daughters of God. We become unsure of our place in community. And lastly, we lose sight of who our Father in Heaven really is. And we see this with Adam and Eve. Back to the creation narrative. That as they have fallen into this lust, this desire of something that wasn't for them, they lost sight of who they were and they hide and they cover themselves. They forget who they are. And worst of all, they forget who God is. 
that they fall into this and they think we must cover ourselves and hide from him. And I just imagine the broken-hearted father walking in the cool of the day, just in anguish. Where are you? I didn't teach you this to hide from me. I've never shown you a heart like this. Why are you covering? Why are you hiding? Finally, when it comes to sexual morality, I pray, do whatever it takes. As we've already talked about, Jesus would say, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Better that you enter eternity with a missing hand or a missing eye than a burned body in hell. That's what Jesus says. Do whatever it takes. I tell you, I have blocked people on social media because I can't fathom seeing another picture by them. Do whatever it takes. Delete social media if you have to. Block specific profiles. Be weary of what type of music you listen to and what type of shows you watch. Very important in our, our digital age. Never stop confessing, repenting, and praying, but also remember to believe the Holy Spirit can and will make you new because His mercies are new every morning.